I'd like to welcome you to lecture 19 of Anatomy and Physiology. This is going to be chapter 15 on special senses, and the special senses get their own um, coverage separate from the rest of the um, nervous system, and a lot of it is due to the fact that these are incredibly specialized uh, groups of receptors that are actually organs uh, in their own. So when we classify the special senses, we're classifying them more based on the organ and then the major job of that organ because some of because these are organs again and some of these structures produce more than one function and interact with each other to help the body um, have an awareness of particularly the environment so these are mostly what we call exteral receptors because they're giving you your perception of the environment and it's something very important to remember because your brain the integration center is what really makes tries to make sense out of the signals coming in and it doesn't always mean that what your these organs are seeing or really what's out there when your brain interprets it so much of them are devoted to you know uh, perceiving and co coordinating what we perceive in the external environment so these senses include hearing which technically in this class you're supposed to call audition and the major organ is going to be the ear now we know that the ear also does another sense in a way called uh, um, environmental perception or balance We're going to, or uh, and you're going to see this a little later when we cover the ear because your awareness of body position is technically another sense because you do have a specific region of the ear that does that we have sight which you're supposed to call vision obviously cover, covered out by the eye the sense of smell, which we're supposed to call olfaction, which is carried out by the nose and not the nose that you see, but the the um, interior part of the nose right near the ethmoid bone. OK, and then taste, which you're supposed to call gustation, which we're going to see is partly carried out by the tongue, but also carried out by olfaction. So some of these do shear functions and some of these organs have dual functions that you don't normally read about and we don't normally talk about. So we're gonna look at the eye and vision first. And what's important to remember when we start looking at these organs is that what they're doing is just taking in signals. They're taking in information. They're not doing anything to it except conveying it through the body, usually through these cranial nerves, okay? So, you know, th through, you know, your parasympathetic nervous system. So these are just, the eye is just basically receiving data. That data is actually turned into information in the brain and for vision, particularly right around the occipital lobe. So we learned that 70% of the, the, um, your sensory receptors, that means literally your sensory receptors in the body are associated with vision, which means we're very visual creatures. We rely on vision as a way of gathering much information about the environment, whether it's dark or light or colors or shadows, whatever, or even movement, because the eye senses movement, which in itself is a separate sense that works together with body coordination. And a significant part of your cerebral cortex, that means the thinking part of your brain, your telencephalon, spends interpreting and trying to make sense of that information. And we're gonna see that the eye too like the central nervous system, which actually it's derived from the central nervous system, the eye cup itself is part of the brain that moves out into the optic cavity. So we're going to see that it's protected by a cushion of fat and a bony orbit made up of your frontal bone and your maxillae. So before we get into what we call the eye proper, that means the actual eye itself, we can look at what are called the accessory structures. That means what works together with the eyes. And what's really interesting embryologically is these structures do not develop properly if the eye itself does not develop. And sometimes defects in the development of the eye also causes defects of these. So the accessory structures include the eyebrows, the eyelids, which was technically supposed to call palpebrae, okay, the conjunctiva, which is actually a, a squamous epidermis that covers the eye. It's continuous with your stratum germinativum or basale. You have the lacrimal apparatus, which basically is a fancy term for the tear ducts. 
and we have what are called the extrinsic eye muscles. That means these are muscles outside of the eye itself. So these are skeletal muscles that are under autonomic control. It's one of the few skeletal muscles that are under autonomic control in your body, and they are located only in the orbital socket. So now let us take a look at the anterior view of the eye. We can see, of course, the eyebrow, the eyelid, the eyelashes, which are kind of like a defense to keep dust and bugs off of your eye. Okay, we have the conjunctiva, which is a continuous covering of skin over the eye. And so it's a, it's a squamous epidermis, a very clear epidermis. It does have blood vessels in it, you can see, which sometimes become inflamed with irritation and sometimes with drinking and, and drug use. Okay, you can see what's called uh, underneath the conjunctiva. You can see the eyeball proper. Okay, and we can see the uh, what's called the lacrimal caruncle. Okay, which is where um, the lacrimal glands release, uh, um, or at least where they drain, where they release tears, but also where tears run out for the upper regions of lacrimal too. And this eventually feeds into the uh, nasal passage. So now we can see a lateral section of the eye. You can see the um, frontal bone here, the orbit, maxilla. Look at the space between the surface of the periosteum here and the eyeball itself, that's a layer of lipid. You can see the extrinsic muscles of the eye that actually rotate and twist the eye and move the eye up and down. Uh, these are some, not, these are technically not extrinsic muscles of the eye. They're more associated with the eye, the eyelid itself. You can see the conjunctiva, which again is c consistent with your skin. So this is more like a stratum germinatum layer. So it's a living layer with blood vessels. Remember that, and it becomes more skin-like. That means develops a dermis. Okay, as you get to the area of the eyebrows, and so pretty much. Um, you can see the opening of the eyelid too. Again, another view, frontal view of the eye, but this is showing the lacrimal apparatus now. So you can see that the actual tear glands themselves are up here and they flow onto the surface of the eye and wash down or come across and then they end up in your little uh, um, uh, um, lacrimal punctum here and the canaliculus, which is a little duct that comes down and it takes the tears and puts them into the nasal passage right around the conchi. And this is why when you're, you're crying, your nasal passage also runs, your nose also runs, and you end up with this mixing with the mucus and running out of your nose or sometimes down your throat. So what's the purpose of the lacrimal gland? Is that the tears keep the uh, conjunctiva wet, it has to be moist to keep from getting brittle and tearing. It also has antibiotic properties, we believe. Okay, and produces enzymes that cleans any gunk off of the conjunctiva. Again, here's another view of the eye showing now uh, the uh, extrinsic muscles. And look where they all come in. These are controlled by uh, uh, parasympathetic nerves, by cranial nerves that, put that, that literally position the eye in different ways. So we could rotate the eye like this, we can pull it like this, pull it out laterally, pull it in medially, pull it superior, inferior, and it then rotate. So um, again, these muscles are under autonomic control, but you can also control them voluntarily. So now let us focus on the structure of the eyeball proper. Okay, we're going to see that the eyeball is composed of three layers that some people call tunics. Tunic just means a covering or a layer. It's just an alternate term. We're going to see this is an outer fibrous layer that is mostly shapes the eye and is connective tissue. It protects the interior and also shapes it. The vascular region we're going to see and then a sensory region of the eye. So we're going to name these a little later. We're going to see that within this these tunics is going to be an internal cavity. Actually, we're going to see there's two internal cavities that are going to be separated by something called the iris. And then there's going to be a structure called the lens, which is going to be, a, it's a very specialized epithelium, we believe. It's hard to determine the true nature of it, but it's probably an epithelium of some type, which allows the passage of light. 
So now let us look at a um, sagittal section of the eye. Okay, so you're looking at the front, obviously the back. Let us look at these layers right now. Okay, and try to identify what they do. So we're looking at here is this outer covering called the sclera. It is again like a very, uh, it's a connective tissue covering. And you can see that the sclera, okay, really is continuous with the optic nerve, which is, and you're looking at now the epineurium covering of the optic nerve, because this is central nervous system here. It's almost like a meningi in a way. So this is almost like a meningi. The sclera runs to here where it's white and tough, and then it kind of transitions here into what's called the cornea, where it's clear and light can pass through this unimpeded. And then again, you get this whitish cover, and again, that continues to the optic nerve. The sclera provides shape for the eye. It also provides protection, and it provides shape for the cornea, so that the cornea is able to collect light uniformly. If you have an astigmatism, there's divots and dents in that cornea that tend to not allow the light in a straight path. So that's the sclera. The choroid layer, which is sometimes called the vascular layer, is full of blood vessels. You can see right here. Okay. It also is very variable as the sclera goes from here to its continuation with what's called the iris. So when we look at the choroid, it starts here because it ends at the optic nerve, is continuous with the sclera, presses against the sclera, and then ends right about here with the iris. The iris is like a diaphragm that opens and closes. This is a region here, okay, called the ciliary body and a suspensory ligament. So this part of the choroid holds the lens and adjusts the lens. This area, the iris, controls the amount of light and the amount of view you have. That means am I looking at a fine pinpoint or a large amount of area? This region of the choroid is pigmented black, and it prevents light scatter in the eyes. People that have um, albinism, that means a lack of um, melanin in the body, skin pigmentation, hair pigmentation, have a lighter choroid that sometimes incoming light basically enters the eye and if there's not a dark choroid the light scatters and bounces around and blurs the image when you have a choroid the light just comes in and excess light is absorbed without bouncing back and around so that does not happen now so now let's look at the innermost layer, the retina. And you can see the retina stops right about here, right around that um, ciliary zone. And it passes into and becomes basically the optic nerve. And you can see some little region there that's a little separate. We'll worry about that a little later. So these are your layers. Now let's look at the chambers. You have a posterior chamber, and you can see that it's a sac, very much like a synovial sac. They don't show it all here. And it is filled with a thick liquid called vitreous humor. Some people confuse and call this posterior chamber the vitreous humor. No, the vitreous humor is a liquid. Humor means liquid, not kind of like funny. Okay, so we got the vitreous humor there. And what that does is it shapes the eye. It also holds the lens in place. And it helps the lens to maintain its structure too when it's changing shape. Um, the aqueous humor is cellular. Understand that it's a secretion, but it has cells that secrete material. So sometimes you'll see dead cells laying in here and also specks of stuff that um, can eventually, when you get older, affect your vision. These things are called flex sometimes. And they don't bother you, but sometimes when you're looking off an end of space, you'll see them slowly floating around. Now let's look at your anterior chamber. And some of that flows into here and around the iris, because the iris is just open, that's a hole. So the anterior chamber is filled with something called aqueous, meaning liquid humor. 
It's a more watery substance. So what it does is it allows the easy passage of light through the cornea into the lens. Okay, and um, you hear about it with the disease called glaucoma because the liquid in there is secreted right about here and released through what's called the canal of Schlem. I don't know if that's on here or not, but um, that liquid is controlled very much like cerebral spinal fluid. And if too much is produced, you end up with glaucoma. And the glaucoma can put unusual pressure on the cornea, misshape it, and also it can put pressure on the lens, prevent the lens from working right, and sometimes even detach the lens. Um, so pretty much we've seen the whole structure of the eye and the major components. So to summarize kind of these features again, with the eye you have the fibrous layer, the sclera. Okay, and the sclera again is continuous with the cornea, which is transparent. Okay, and it's a fibrous layer that again allows light to come in and focus into the eye. You have your vascular layer, which is sometimes called the uh, uvea, and this is continuous with the choroid. Okay, and basically it's part of the choroid and the ciliary body and the iris. Again, its job we mentioned is to prevent light scatter and to also control the amount of light going into the eye. So part of this vascular layer is to work the ciliary body, which works together again with the iris and the lens and the parasympathetic system and sympathetic system have control over this to allow the ciliary body and lens and the iris to basically uh, either con uh, contract, basically form a small opening or dilate, make a large opening, depending on what the need is. So the parasympathetic nervous system allows for close vision, very constricted pupil, sympathetic for distance vision, open pupil or dilated pupil. And there again, we just discussed the iris, which is controlled with the lens by this choroid or vascular layer. So getting back to these features again, we can see where all these structures fit in. And, and again, the choroid is going to be a very part uh, particularly important structure because not only if it's protective value for allowing vision to occur, as far as prevent the scanner of light, but also for allowing what's called accommodation. That means the ability to see far and near and the ability for the eye to adjust to dark and light. This slide is showing a frontal view of the control of the iris. So the iris again is choroid layer. The, the pupil itself, the opening is actually just an opening and that glassy thing you see in there is gonna be your lens. So the parasympathetic nervous system, what it does is it twists some sphincter muscles that close that pupil, and we call that constriction. And what that does is funnel light into one small part to help you focus at closed vision. It also reduces the amount of light going to the eye. And then we have the dilated position where you allow a lot of light to come into the eye, particularly in a dark room, but also allows you to have distance vision to, to, and basically to allow the light into this large area where it could be captured by as much of the retina as possible to see distance, objects, and panoramas. So now what we're going to do is focus on this area right here. And we're going to pay very close attention to your retina. So here's how your retina is structured. And this is what kind of surprises a lot of people. So these are actually axons. They yellow it, color it yellow to represent the myelin. So these, this is the axons. And what the axons are attached to, okay, are these little nerve cells right here that we're going to call rods and cones a little later. So when we look at this, information from the eye, that means light coming in from the eye, is going to come in, pass through that posterior chamber, and it just passes literally through the axons, and then it hits right here. These are the receptors of the eye that see dark, black, and white, that see color. I'm going to show you your choroid layer here. There's your blackened choroid layer, which prevents the light from bouncing back and doing what's called reverberating and reflecting back and forth across 
those receptors, those light receptors. So that's the path of light. And then what happens when we look at the signal? The signal from the eye starts here and then moves its way to these axons and goes down the octave nerve to the brain. And just a point of note, look at the vasculature here that feeds the choroid. I just think that's interesting to look at. I mean, this is a living structure. We have to pay attention to that. So when we look at how light comes in, we're going to see that you're going to have some limitations to your vision. You're going to have an area of the eye where, the, where most of the light is going to kind of focus and hit right about here. It's actually missing in this diagram, but it's going to be a little region where you mostly focus your eye called the fovea. Then there's a little area called the optic disc, which means this is where the blood vessels and axons come in. And notice here, there are no pigmented cells in this spot. This is a region we're going to call the blind spot. Blind as in cannot see. That means any light that hits that is not going to create a signal. So you're going to see a little hole. But then the nice thing about it is you really have to hold your eye steady in order to see that hole and focus on a particularly white barren surface with a little black dot. So you can put the black dot over that blind spot and make it disappear because you don't see it. There's a little test we, you can do for that. You can look up online blind spot and mess around with that all you want and find out how big your blind spot is where it is. So the blind spot is just an accident. But what your body does is it ignores it by wiggling the eye gently to make sure that light uh, is not always focusing on that blind spot. Now, while we're on the blind spot, let's talk about the non-blind spot, those photoreceptors. And we can see the photoreceptors are broken up into two broad, two broad categories. Those that see bright light and color, and those that interpret dim light, which doesn't perceive color. It just perceives black, white, and shades of gray. So we have two types of color receptors, color photoreceptors. One is going to be called the rod, and these are the most numerous of the receptors. They're shaped like a rod, and all animals possess this. It allows them to perceive light in general. Okay, they, they also communicate with your pineal gland, because your pineal gland in some animals is exposed and can see light in itself. So part of these rods communicate with the pineal gland to tell your brain what is the amount of light and dark, because that's what the pineal gland covers. It produces a hormone in response to nighttime and daytime. And that hormone is built up or broken down depending on the length of day or night. Okay, so um, this also allows us to perceive movement. Okay, and that, uh, and, um, Basically, you know, it, it works in dim light. They're bleached out by bright light. And that's why if you're ever in a dark room, okay, and, and go outside, at first it's very blinding. And then what happens is eventually these receptors kind of shut down, and now you're seeing what your other structures called the cones. Now you have the cones. And the best way to remember cones besides the fact that the cells are shaped like little actually popsicles or upside down ice cream cones. Okay, they, there's two types and they see color vision. So remember cones color. Okay, they usually require bright light. That's why in dim light, it's difficult to see color and colors have sort of like a grayish, you know, appearance and sometimes it's difficult, like for some people to have chromatic aberrations to see oranges from reds and other things like that. Um, Cones are found heavily in an area called the macula lutea or the fovea centralis. And this is where, and again, this is a part of your eye cup. That's your optic nerve where most of your vision is going to take place during the day. And it allows you to have the best view. That's why when you look straight forward, you can see an object the best. It's colors 
or more prevalent, you can see what basically better pixels versus other parts of your eyes, which are lesser in cones, and it's more difficult to see detail and to perceive the light. So the cones give high color acuity. And this is why colorblind people have issues. If they can't see all the spectrums of colors, it's hard to see the details. It's like looking like at more of a pixelated image. So what do these buggers look like? Okay, there's your odds. Again, they see black and white. They see in dim light. Notice how many are. Notice they're facing the back. That means light's coming in this way. And your choroid layer's right here. And then the light sends the signal down towards these little interneurons. This is actually a mini brain right here that figures out how to send signals into the appropriate parts of the optic nerve. There's your cones that see color. Notice how much less they are. And they have different types of chemicals that perceive light than the rods. But look at these neural pathways. These are divergent and convergent pathways. What are they for? To help the brain to form an image by, no, by producing an awareness of that image. Okay, and also what it does is when an object is moving past your eye, these allow the brain to basically trace that image. By, by looking at the patterns of neural firing through these uh, convergent and divergent pathways. So the, the, the um, retina is involved in not just seeing, but also perception of movement and direction. And it not only sees color, but also sees black and white and the perception of dark and light. Now this gets a little confusing when you look at this, but Color vision, the way they teach it to you usually is a lie, because we tell you that there are three types of cones, the blue cones, the green cones, and the red cones. And guys, it's not that that's all they see. It just means that these wavelengths of light cause the best, the strongest neural impulse. But other colors of life can too, but it's a little less. So that means you get the best and most acting potentials from these particular wavelengths of light. So when we look at the blue, a wavelength of what's called 420 nanometers. I'm not going to make you memorize that. 420 nanometers not only stimulates it 100%, that means 100% action potential, it also gives a graded potential in blue and then green also gives a greater potential, but yellow and reds do not. Let's look at the rods. They see well in blue and green, but they don't perceive it as color. They perceive it as dark or light. Isn't it kind of funny? We see better blues much better. Blues and greens are the things you see better. And this is why sometimes in room lights, they tend to make room lights more of a blue greenish color. And when you take pictures in room light, sometimes you see the pictures turn out blue or green because it screws up cameras. Cameras are trying to see even light and even white light, but your eyes tend to see more of a blue and a green, but it's still your brain makes you think you're seeing other colors. Don't worry about that. It's kind of freaky and it even freaks out me to try to understand it. When we look at the green cones, they see green the best, but they can also see a little blue and see a little yellow and hardly see red. Red cones are the most confusing. They see greenish yellow and they see red pretty much as crappy as everybody else, but they can see more of a yellowish. So when light hits these, what's happening is really what you'll do is your brains or your brain is perceiving signals of basically all of these colors being seen in very small amounts or large amounts or in different types of action potentials that are coming to the brain depend on thing, what light is impinging the retina, coming upon the retina. And all these are working at the same time, producing a spectrum of color. Now, there are people that have color blindness. 
what's called true absolute color blindness. And sometimes they call that yellow green color blindness. I mean, red green color blindness. That means that they can't distinguish red and green because these cones are not working and everything appears gray except blues and anything that relies on blues. So they can't see a little green. They can't see some color, but they can't see a lot of it. Now, my family has a defect thanks to generations of inbreeding and my both of my parents' ethnic groups. Um, we have a high amount of what are called enchromic aberrations or and these enchromic aberrations we have variations of the pigments that make the red green and blue cones now some are affected in the bloom cone some the red some the green and some two some three I, th I have a defect that affects three so all three but it gives it gives me the ability to see many colors particularly the primary colors so I can tell red from green from blue but it's difficult for me to sometimes tell what is actually purple what is blue so for example some of you see a beautiful transition here I don't I see a big blob of blue except at the far edges and some of you see variations of green from here to here I don't I see a blob of just a uniform green Okay, and the same is true from here to here. You may see a transition that sometimes I see as dark and light, but to me it's dark red, light red. I have difficulty seeing pink because that's a blending of now these receptors, particularly working with the rods. So we have people that have all sorts of variations in colors that are brought about by these color tests, and that's actually how I learned it. I learned that I have a son and, and daughter to also have minor aberrations that are a little different than mine because they picked up, of course, some of their mother's genetics. So color vision is a very difficult thing, but it's really kind of neat. It allows us to see very nicely in the blue and the green. But what's really funny is some colors tend to be annoying and bright to us, and that is particularly red light. When you have very bright red light, it is basically an area that is usually we're not used to seeing a lot of. And look at this, we can also see them with all three of these structures here. So all of these are receiving red, and that sends a signal to the brain that's almost an alert. And many creatures do this. Red is a very important color for many creatures. Now understand too that not all creatures have the same types of rods and cones. We believe most creatures can see color, but differently than us. And some creatures could actually see infrared that means they can see here and it appears as a reddish color to them some creatures and that's what snakes do many snakes can do that they can see heat infrared is actually heat because heat is just a wavelength we can't and i've worn military infrared glasses and it was, and it was literally weird to see heat because it's like my gosh i'm not used to it it's like a ghostly little shadow many insects can see what's called ultraviolet to you, it's invisible because we don't have anything to really detect as much because ultraviolet is right about the weaker area of the cones. And anyway, that's all kind of mishmash and blended in that you perceive as a blue. And sometimes it's just clear, period. So we can't perceive that or we minimally perceive ultraviolet where bees can see it. So that's color vision. Very complex, very entertaining. Sometimes when you try to figure out Am I seeing the same colors as everybody else? Because I didn't know for the longest period of time. It took me till I was 26 years old before I realized I had an aberration of color vision. So how does an image form? And here's where the brain comes into work. Notice we're spending a lot of time on the eye because it is, again, where 70% of your uh, environmental stimuli come in. So when you look at an object, and that's a horrible tree drawing, called it a lollipop tree. Notice that you see the tree upright. So what happens is the way you see that tree is light has to be able to reflect off of that tree, bounces off of that tree. So what happens is all sorts of light is bouncing off, particularly green light. That means that this tree is absorbing every color but green and the green bounces off. And if this is brown, brown's kind of a weird color I don't quite understand, but it means that there's probably a little red, a little blue in there, 
maybe a little green that your eyes perceive as brown bouncing off of there. Okay, so light has to bounce. That's why in a dark room you can't see anything because there's no light to bounce. And in a dim room, there's very little light to bounce off and it's difficult to sometimes see those colors. So, the path of light bounces off of an object. Straight line passes through your conjunctiva, which really, unless there's problems with the conjunctiva, doesn't cause any problems, passes through the cornea. Now, if the cornea is misshaped or has pits in it, it causes astigmatism type distortions. It makes the image unclear. Passes through the aqueous humor, through the pupil, that means the opening in that lens right there. So there's your lens. The light then passes through the iris, which now the path of light is focused at a point. It comes in at an angle and then passes through the bulk of the retina, the axons of the retina, and now stops at the choroid, which does blocked and absorbed. Now look at this. And this is very typical of when you work with a microscope is that you see everything upside down and twist it from right to left, left to right. You see it upside down and basically kind of mirror image. This is the data. This is what your eye perceives. Now, of course, when these signals go to the brain, your brain learns early on in life to twist this image away from its mirror image and then from upside down to right side up. So your brain, the integration center, does this. People that have damage to that region literally see things as mirror image and they see things upside down, the way the eye is supposed to see it. This is what happens when you work with a microscope. Some microscopes have a corrective lens like binoculars or telescopes that correct the image for you. They have another lens that reverses the image. Where the image hits the retina is called the focal point. And that focal point is most clear at the fovea in the peripheral regions here or around here. If you're looking at the whole coverage of the eye, the image appears less detailed. This is why when you have like crime scene witnesses or you're just walking around, you're more likely to see things and remember things in front of your eye than at the peripheral on the sides because you see less detail and your brain is more focusing on this image right here, right in the center. And that is known when when um, they're interviewing you for, as, a, as a visual witness, okay, because they ask you, was this at the edge of your view or in the middle of your view? They want to know, did you see it peripherally or right on that fovea? We can get the most details. Okay, image formation depends if the, if the image is distant or near. So what happens when an object is distant you have to have a, dist a different shape of the lens to make sure that that object focuses on the, uh, the rods and cones on that choroid layer. I mean, the retinal layer. Well, literally it is on the choroid layer, but right on the retina. Okay, when images are near, you have to do what's called the near point adjustment. So notice how the lens gets fat here and skinny here. With far objects, the lens stretches out. Near objects, the lens chunkies up a little. And to see a far object, a pupil is open, it's narrower with near objects. You don't need as much light. You're not capturing as much. Here, you're capturing as much of the image as possible, meaning a lot of light comes in. And sometimes the pupil, particularly, has to adapt with that lens to make sure that not too much light, not too little light comes in. It's an incredibly complex thing, very much like if you use a, a, a manual camera, you learn this real quickly, where you're looking at a distant image, but there's too much light, you have to adjust all these features and then have the right film to capture that image too, depending on, you know, again, the photo conditions. Now there's conditions associated with the eye, and it usually could be a factor of your lens or the shape of the eye cup, because some people, this, the, the sclera, can have different shapes. It could be a little more uh, a little more upright or a little more oblong. And we do know that as people age, the, ch the shape of the eye cup sometimes changes. And it tends to uh, change shape in a way that, some, that, that um, affects 
your near or far-sighted vision. And some of these changes we call presbyopia, that means the aging of the eye. And a lot of it just has to do with the production of connective tissues and the extrinsic muscles of the eye, how they, how they hold that eye in place and pull on the eye. So with normal vision, notice the shape of your cup there, blah, 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 and the light focuses right on that choroid retinal area. If you're called nearsighted, that means the image focuses here. But what happens is you get light that still continues. The light still continues. It doesn't stop there. It continues as another beam. So what happens is this is the clear image. This comes out to be a fuzzy image. And what we do is we put a lens like glasses over the eye and that adjusts the focus. So all we're saying is that when you're looking at an object, you want light will be coming like this. Literally, if the light could pass through your eye, it would literally pass through and take a path like this and spread out again. So this point here called the focal point, that means where this point tapers to a spot is your best focus. So if your best focus is here, you see fuzz. Sometimes the best focus is theoretically past the eye. That means it's just gone. And you, I mean, it's absorbed. You never see that fine focus point. And then you see a fuzzy image here, which again can be corrected with a lens. So overall, okay, here is what's called accommodation. Here's your image. Remember, it's backwards, upside down. Sympathetic nervous system with a distance object. It allows the lens to take a narrow shape. Tries to tend to keep the pupil a little open. Okay, look at the action on the ciliary body. Okay. Now you're looking at a near object. The light is focused on a smaller spot. So you close that pupil. You fatten the lens a little. So adjust the focal point to be right around there. Now, to kind of end this, because I know this is a lot on the eye, it's almost half of this, more than half of this lecture, is this is what's really strange, is each eye is separated into what's called left and right view. And just know this. It's really kind of weird, but it also explains a structure called the optic chiasma. That means when the optic nerves come in, they crisscross and split in half to go to the left and the half right parts of the brain. So, watch this. If, you're, if you have an object here, its light comes from here, hits that part of the retina, that part of the retina, and that's what you see. Oops. Now, that, look at the pathways. That goes there, and that goes there. So your left view literally goes towards the right eye. Now we're gonna see this helps us produce something called stereoscopic vision. Because it's gonna put these two separate fields together, overlap them back here, and give you stereoscopic vision. That's why we have two eyes. It gives us to be able to see three dimensions. Now, this field, Light comes from here, so the right, the light coming from here goes there, goes there, they travel again here, and it blends here. That is cool. Okay, and you could literally, your brain is so good at this, you can put a board right here and block your vision, okay? And the brain can sometimes try to make a whole picture out of this by kind of trying to help you perceive what is left and right and could actually build a picture from this view or this view. There's all sorts of psychiatric tests to look at this and fun little uh, um, tests of how these uh, the eyes work that do this. And you can also tell different types of strokes and brain damage from this too and optic nerve damage. So we're not gonna get into all of that, but it's, a, it's incredible 
how the brain is even able to make an image from all this information and give us this 3D view of the world and be able to tell motion too as objects in our field of view move from here to here. So now let us get away from vision and look at this whole idea of chemical stations, senses. And um, understand that basically in the past we separated taste from smell. That means gustation and olfaction. But um, these really work together. And even though they travel down um, different nerve pathways, they all end up going um, through the limbic system for similar processing. And often there's confusion between the two. Because particularly when you put food in your mouth, the warmth and moisture in your mouth um, sends those fragrances, particularly a lot of fragrances, uh, um, to the um, your nasopharynx where your olfactory area is. So, and sometimes when you smell stuff, I hate to tell you this, like especially when you're smelling poop or vomit, you're also tasting it. And sometimes that's what gives you the gag response. So these are both integrated, you know, because you're smelling and literally tasting at the same time. But what, what they also have in common is the fact that they are chemoreceptors. It means they have very specific chemicals that you can smell. And this is what's neat about odors, is you can smell odors other creatures can't, and they can smell odors we can't. And then there's these odors called pheromones, which we believe um, we can detect, but not as well as other animals. And it's in a little, another chemo sense uh, receptor area, uh, deep in the nose uh, called the vomeronasal gland. And again, there's a little debate about whether ours work or not, but we do know that the evidence is there that that um, in adults we have this functional gland. So the chemical sense, again, are very specific, is that you have to have the receptor to respond to that molecule. What you're doing is tasting molecules. And we're going to see that taste requires the presence of moisture for the receptors to work. So when we look at where olfaction takes place, olfaction again means smell. The actual data is going through something called the olfactory bulb. And this eventually goes to the olfactory tract, the olfactory nerve. This is a parasympathetic input here. This goes through the cranial nerves. So what ha happens is that um, literally fragrance that means volatile chemicals what we call volatile means uh, smells that uh, transported in the air usually as an oil or dissolved in water go up to your na nasal passage which is nice and warm and and um, you know moist and what happens then is that fragrance attaches to neuroreceptors Various. We don't know how many for olfaction because there's all sorts of weird types of smells and weird types of receptors that sometimes fit loosely or tightly to certain uh, materials. So what happens is the fragrance goes there and then you get an action potential that perceives that as a particular smell based on which receptor is being fired. The brain takes over and puts that into, you know, basically emotions. So if you so if you sm have the fragrances of a pizza, your brain puts it together as a pizza, and it may notice the difference between pepperoni or just cheese, but then that might say yum or yuck, or it might even send a signal of, oh my gosh, there goes my rear end if I eat all of that. And and sometimes you might smell something like poop. I mean, and for some creatures, that's a great odor, because that means food or, you know, hey man, dead body around, great, I can lay my eggs in it. You know, so uh, um, it all varies with the organism how the brain, you know, interprets that. But the point is, is that in moist climates and when the atmosphere is wetter, it's easier to detect sense molecules, which is why like if you're in a shower, you notice your body odor better when the shower is running because the moisture in there is a little greater. If you're in a dry climate, very hot climate, the moisture particles are kind of a little more diffused out and sometimes don't impinge properly Okay, and they don't transport properly, and particularly drier climates. You, the, the nasal pitches might even be dry to the point where the molecules cannot dissolve on the surface of the olfactory bulb. I mean, and, and, and therefore, you don't detect that odor. And I've seen this in industry with people working in large, uh, cleaning large industrial tanks, or they're in a large area that's hot and dry, and they can't smell a lot of the odors and end up in trouble because they don't smell something that's potentially flammable. 
and the place literally blows up with them never knowing it that, that it was going to happen so in a little more detail this is what your factory bulb looks like there's the sensors all sorts of different ones and we don't know how many there are there could be up to 15 20 different types of things that we sense by smell okay and most of these are what we call volatile that means these are these are frequencies that are usually certain types of lipids or, or lighter compounds that you know dissolve in the air and these are for a particularly different purpose in the survival of many creatures some of these fragrances we use to determine identity of an organism to, to, to determine um you know whether that's my child in the case of many seals it can also make gender determinations depending on the older we also know that we can smell fragrances and sweat that tell if a person is healthy or not and the brain interprets that in any one of particular ways so what happens is for the neural pathway the motor molecules sit on a receptor cause a particular action percent potential that's receptor specific and that goes into the optic bulb through a bunch of pathways that basically then converge into the brain and the brain then interprets that and that usually goes to what's called the you know the olfactory region of the brain which is towards the frontal region of the brain um, you'll also see olfactory glands which make sure that there's mucus here and that that is moist enough for the receptors to work now sometimes in dry climates or when you um, uh, are taking antihistamines and sometimes in elderly people they produce less mucus this layer um, gets a little thinner and drier and it prevents you know the smell from being easily detected another thing can happen is if you have a runny nose or, or a hyper producing mucus this layer becomes so thick the fragrance molecules don't get there and it makes it hard to detect odors so that's olfaction taste works in a similar manner except it's a different type of chemistry it's usually not gases and fragrances but rather particles like salts you know sugars amino acids that dissolve in water and sometimes in oil like spices that then go into uh, um, receptors on the tongue and we see that the tongue is covered with things called taste buds which again are sensory receptors and we have different types of ones that are positioned in the tongue to, to have different purposes what we call fungiform foliate and circumvallate I'm not going to make you know all of those but these are found in various types of animals even flies have these accumulations of different receptors that serve different purposes some are just for taste some are for reflex that means you taste something that's bitter and sour and disgusting and I know some people you know don't like to taste the coffee because it has a very similar response to the taste of putrid food and that makes people vomit and these receptors are found in particular regions of the tongue to alert the brain of what's going on in what goes in our mouth or what we even smell through our mouth in a way so um, like I mentioned earlier when you taste food most of it is the coordination between your olfaction that means smell and the tongue and 80 percent of the fragrances that you get from food are actually due to the smell and this is why uh, many restaurants when they vent their smells the cooking smells out into the street that's kind of mean in a way because um <laughs> it, it's really making your body think you're tasting it and that gives you the response man I'd like to have that in some cases maybe not but it kind of stimulates hunger a little okay so um, some other things that affect taste are also thermal receptors mechanoreceptors and pain receptors in the mouth so that's why sometimes hot foods can cause pain that, that work together with taste that give you an impression of that food and temperature and texture work together sometimes to also detract from taste so taste is many things you learn this particularly in in uh, autistic children where where just the texture of food alone or the temperature of food alone can make them think food tastes bad so there's some psych psychological factors that also influence how these um, chemoreceptors work 
and sometimes combinations of chemoreceptors working together affect how your body perceives taste. So there's no absolute taste because things like vultures, crows, flies, they love horrible tastes that would make us gag. And we like tastes that would make them gag. Most creatures, funny enough, like the taste of sweet. because it's and, and we're going to see that some tastes affect the limbic system to sometimes cause you to be over addicted uh, to a taste and not just like it, but actually crave it in cases and also reduce stress with it. It can induce serotonin, which has a happy effect and an addicting effect on the body. So there's your tongue. And we can see, uh, ignore the tonsils in a way. These are actually lymph nodes. That means this is immune system here. And there's some of your tongue muscles, which are attached to your hyoid. Okay. And this is what's called the uh, um, lingual tonsil right here. This is what catches a, a, a lot of toxins in food and alerts the body that something's going on. Uh, what's also neat about this region is that, um, you know, it, it um, produces immune cells that sometimes try to catch bacteria that go down the body, but mainly it's an alert system that can sometimes induce an immediate rash on your body when you're eating certain foods. But let's focus on taste. So there's some of your taste buds back there. This is called the front, the, the, the back guard. What those taste buds do is they're particularly sensitive to bitter tastes of rotting food and stuff like that. And they can actually induce a gag response, a reflex that makes you throw up. And you can do this by even touching those receptors with a finger. So we find, and those are the, uh, we find a different group of receptors here. And we find a different group of the more common types of receptors there, the fungiform of the more common. Let's look at a close up of these receptors is that the taste buds are found in pits because why because you want this pit to, to have mucus and fluid in it to keep these receptors wet because that's the only way they can basically take on the molecules that bind to the receptors so what type of test taste sensations do we have notice i didn't mention smells because that's up to debate and there are up to maybe 15 20 different types of odors that you detect and maybe even more so these are ones that we know, and it used to be four, now it's five, because a new one was detected uh, based on some uh, um, misconceptions about uh, a spice called glutamate, monosodium glutamate used particularly in Asian cooking. So we have what are called the sweet receptors, which taste a variety of molecules that your body interprets as glucose, sugars. Glucose is the basis, it has a 100% firing of these receptors and anything related to it gives a similar response. A nice thing about sugars too is they go directly into limbic system and produce what's called satiation. It means, man, I like this. In some cases, an addictive satiation. It also has an antidepressant effect sometimes, which is why dessert is, has this satisfying effect on us. And we use it sometimes as a way of coping with stress. So sugars fit into that. Also uh, artificial sweeteners, alcohol, believe it or not, ethanol and glycol, certain types of alcohols. Alcohols also can stimulate a bitter receptor too, but mainly it has a sweeter taste, which again is related to that happiness associated with it. And certain amino acids that are found in proteins. And sometimes these amino acids are used as artificial sweeteners. Then there's sour. That means the taste of lemon, and this is actually due to acid. So what you're actually tasting is pH. The more the pH, the more that receptor is stimulated to the point where it's saturated, and it's actually painful. It damages the receptors, and you're eliciting pain receptors. So you're tasting actually hydrogen ions, pH. Salt, you're actually tasting what are called the metals, the first two groups of the periodic table. So you can taste a variety of salts, inc um, uh, including uh, um, sodium, potassium. They all fit in those receptors a little differently and send a different signal or go through receptors that have different types of salt detecting receptors. So you can taste calcium. You can taste when blood because the iron in the blood. So there's various metals that we use as seasoning sometimes and just that you can sometimes put your mouth accidentally and detect that it's there. Then there's bitter, and this includes things like um, 
certain alkaloids, that means compounds found in coffee, found in al alcoholic beverages, quinine, and nicotine. And then there's the umami, which detect particularly something called aspartate and glutamine, which are found in many foods that uh, uh, are used as substitute salts, like monosodium glutamate. And it's used a lot in Asian cooking, and now it's basically spread its way around. Now, there's a misconception about the tongue. At one time, we thought that only specific regions of the tongue could taste certain things, only certain receptors are there. So at one time, we thought only bitter was tasted back here and nowhere else. Okay, that sour was here, salt was here, and sweet was here. We mean on both sides here. Okay, sour and salt. And that this was empty. Then we thought that this was where the umami receptors were. And that everything else was, it was pure taste. And at one time, people would taste the sweetness of a food by putting it on the tip of their tongue and the sourness of, let's say, coffee and wine by putting it on the side of their tongue or the bitterness by putting it on the back of their tongue. And we know that is not true anymore today. What we discovered is that every taste bud, the five different types, are, are found all over the tongue, very much like is true with the receptors of olfaction. But now what we learn is that they're more concentrated in certain areas. So the bitter are yes found on the tip but also found back there but they're more excited back here you get more of an action potential than up here this is more of a graded response salt is also found here a little back there and there and this is how what allows you to get a wide variety of tastes of foods funny enough your sweet we always thought was only up here but now we know some sweet is here here and here and so on and notice that the base of your tongue has all of these receptors, but different degrees of sensitivity. So usually you either get a full action potential or a graded potential. A partial potential means you need more sour up here to get the taste of it. But this is what makes cooking an incredible chemistry, is that a good cook could make a meal in such a way that it affects these receptors in different ways to come out with a particular taste, a particular what they call so I hope the coverage on olfaction and taste didn't stink or didn't leave a bad taste in your mouth. But now let's focus on the next most complex sense compared to vision. And this is to be the function of the ear. We're going to look at the process of hearing or audition very briefly. And then we're going to look at the whole idea of balance, which we're going to call equilibrium. That means how does the body perceive that it's standing still in a particular position? We're going to call that static equilibrium. Or how does the body know it's moving in relationship to the environment, which we call dynamic equilibrium. And this equilibrium is thrown off when you're in motion, particularly fast motion, because the body is not set up for this. And I remember they taught me that in, uh, when I was doing uh, pilot you know, training in the Air Force, and also I've learned it now by working on, you know, uh, space committees looking at uh, uh, astronaut environmental safety. So we're going to see that the air is composed of three important structures, which are anatomically distinct developmentally. The outer ear or external ear, the middle ear or tympanic region, which we're going to call the conductive reasoning region. And then the internal or middle ear is going to be the uh, neural region of the ear. Each has a different developmental feature to it. And on this, we're going to understand, too, that the ear actually contains bones that are related to the ribs and the hyoid. Very unusual. Now, what is the function of these parts? We're going to see that the external and middle ear are going to be actually involved in the data collection. They're going to collect the sound from the environment. And this is going to involve funneling sound into your ear and adjusting your head to get the maximum sound. Uh, and, and that involves body positioning. And since you have two ears, you are very good at collecting waves from the environment that meet these ears at different that, that meet each ear at either the same time or a different time to tell you the position of sound. I mean that, that's how the brain interprets it. We're going to see that the internal ear 
is going to function actually in the neural processing of turning sound into something that the brain could interpret. And also it's involved in what we call equilibrium, balance. The receptors of the ear are going to be totally specialized for a vibrational frequency, or we're going to see a mechanoreceptor that tells you what your body position is. So let us look at the external ear. And just know that what you're looking at here is a cup that basically focuses sound waves as they come in. So sound waves are going to kind of come in like this. And those sound waves are going to get focused by the shape of the ear and those little valleys and ridges so that the sound all collects in this thing called the external acoustic or auditory meatus. The external auditory meatus is an optional term. So this is a little funnel that collects sound and basically amplifies it. It magnifies it. And this is the problem if a person has this part of the air destroyed, removed. If that's removed, you only get sound that comes straight in and they can hear only partially and they have to direct their head to better funnel and focus sound. Now dogs, as you know, they have ears that kind of point up like this and are movable and positional and they can actually, instead of moving their head, dogs and cats do this, they can just wiggle that ear and even flatten it or round it to better collect distant sound or nearby sound. So this is a region called the auricle which kind of means like the, um, the little collection device. And don't worry about the helix and the lobule there. So all of this area is right on your temporal bone. The external auditory meatus goes into your temporal bone. So the external ear stops right about where you don't want to stick a Q-tip any deeper. So there's a little Q-tip and you're cleaning your ears out, don't go any further than the external ear or you will puncture a hole in you. So here's now the middle ear. Let me delineate that for you right about here. And this is called the conduction center, we'll see. This contains a very thin tissue that can vibrate in response to sound and the vibrations, the loudness can be determined by how tight these bones are. These are three bones uh, called sometimes the, the um, auditory bones. And we're going to see they each have a name. And what they do is they vibrate when the eardrum vibrates in response to sound. So sound literally hits this, vibrates that, that, and that. We'll see a little later. And that's how you collect the data of sound. And these bones are related to ribs and the hyoid bone. It's really kind of neat. And people are born with birth defects of these bones many times, and they have a disease called conduction deafness. Here is now your internal ear or inner ear. And this is actually now deep inside. Well, actually, this is shallow in the temporal bone. This is deep in the temporal bone. And you can actually see the ridge for this when you look at the opened up skull, looking down in the inferior region of the temporal bone. And you have this area called the labyrinth. It's like a maze. And you can see the uh, what's called the vestibular and cochlear nerves. The cochlear nerve transmits, or is also called the uh, auditory nerve, which transmits sound. And the vestibular here, okay, transmits um, balance. So what is sound, first of all? Sound is what we call a pressure wave. It's basically the movement or the vibration that passes through a solid object and particularly a gas. We, our hearing is set up for sound through a gas. If you ever go swimming or diving, you can see how sound changes immediately when sound is being transported to a liquid, it's a little more amplified. And I remember when I was diving, how weird the sounds were and that you could really hear sounds for great distances. Whales take advantage of that because they can send up signals that can be heard for hundreds of miles away. And I think the longest recorded whale sound was like 500 miles away. That hasn't been fully supported yet, but the data shows that in liquid sound can be detected at very great distances. And sound in the air is affected by 
atmospheric pressure, that means the density of the air, because denser air produces sound better, the, the temperature of the air, because warmer air does not conduct sound as well as cold air, and by the moisture in the air, because when there's moisture, it could sometimes impede or improve the conduction of sound depending on the type of wave. So sound is basically produced by vibration, vibrating the molecules that are in your atmosphere. And that vibration is measured by either frequency or wavelength, which your body hears the same. So don't worry if we say frequency or wavelength, your ear determines it the same way. And what that means is when we look at the wave, it determines basically the rapidity that that wave is coming at you. The closeness of those bumps, the waves, that's, a, that's representing a vibration. Amplitude is separate. That's the height of the waves, and that means basically loudness. So here's two waves of the same frequency or basically wavelength, but this one is less energy, this is higher energy, and you hear this as loudness. So your ears are able to perceive pitch and loudness. Pitch is usually due to Wavelength of frequency, hertz is a frequency unit, okay? Or you can get loudness in a form of decibels, which is a, a, an amplitude. It means a, a size of the wave or intensity of sound unit. And usually you don't want to go above 120 because that could actually damage the ossicles. That means the bones in your ear, or it could damage or thicken the ear drum and definitely can cause mental issues too. Sometimes loud noise is used as a means of coercion and torture. So I discussed this with you. This is looking at two different wavelengths of sound. Remember, light is a wavelength too, except that affects different types of receptors that change the nature of pigments in the cones and the rods. In this case, you're just vibrating an eardrum at either very quickly or very slowly. And here you're vibrating a dry drum either very intensely or very gently. And this is all detected by those bones and by the internal ear. So how do we perceive sound? A vibration comes in as shown here, step one. It gets funneled in, which increases the amplitude a little. Okay, which is why if you listen to loud sounds, that amplitude can be dangerously loud for you. Um, so what happens here is you vibrate the eardrum. It kind of wiggles back and forth, depending on the frequency and amplitude. That then rattles this bone, which is called the malleus. That stands for hammer. It shakes, it, it, that then bangs against the incus. These are real bones, and that's a real joint right there. It's a fibrous joint. It's not a synovial joint. It's a fibrous, a loose attachment with basically a ligament. Okay, so what happens is this vibrates. That's called the incus, which means an anvil, sort of like what the old blacksmiths used to bang a horseshoe or a piece of metal against. And then it's, it, it um, vibrates this thing called a stapes, which is a Latin term for the stirrup found on a horse, like where you put your feet in on certain types of saddles. So these each vibrate each other. Now, why do they do that? Why do you want three bones that are attached by muscles, actually, and ligaments? That's because you want to be able to gauge how much information is going to this unit called the cochlea, the inner ear. Because what happens is your brain, you know, it, it can't really control volume. So what happens is, these bones control the volume of incoming sound. So if you have a very gentle sound that barely can vibrate that tympanum, what happens is these bones tighten up, the muscles tighten to make them very rigid. It improves conduction. Conduction goes better through a solid, rigid object. So what happens is this tightens and these bones all literally bang against each other more easily. It tightens this so much that the sound basically becomes amplified. And what your brain does, it perceives a signal from these bones, from that muscle through stretch receptors that say, I'm tight. So the sound coming in is very gentle because your brain really distinguishes that. 
And then if a sound is loud, what happens is that these muscles uh, release and these bones become very wiggly, very loosely attached. This becomes very loose. That means a loud sound has to take a lot of energy to vibrate this. And then these take a lot more energy to vibrate to pass the sound along to the cochlea. Now what's happening is the brain now is saying, oh, those bones are loose, the muscles are loose, and therefore that sound is loud. Incredible coordination here. So problems. If a sound is too loud, it could actually damage the ligaments here and actually damage that attachment and in some case cause scarring of this. We know uh, people that listen to sounds over 160 decibels could really even dislocate these bones. And then we have what's called conduction deafness. That means the sound can't get past here. And the person has to have a special device that picks up sound and transmits signals electrically through a circuit to the cochlea. And, it's, and you never get the full range of hearing with that type of device. Some are a little better than others. Okay. Um, conduction deafness can also be corrected by putting a vibration along the mastoid process. And at least you can hear muttering of sounds by vibrating here and going to that region. So guys, when you hear, you're also hearing vibrations within your throat because that's actually your throat. It gets vibrations from your throat. Okay, particularly up what's called the eustachian tube right here. So vibrations can be felt in that bone, in that chamber, and also from there. So sometimes, like when a, I know when an airplane's flying overhead, I get the sound of the airplane going through my tympanum and also through the vibrations in my skull, which gives a little more muffled sound to it. So even a person who has conduction deafness can hear certain vibrations that the brain determined, I mean, detects as hearing. Okay, now what's really funny is what's called accommodation. If you're very listening to very low, light sounds, low, ampl uh, low amplitude sounds, this all tightens up. And let's say now a loud sound comes along. The, the brain gets really freaked up because it gets so loud because these are so tight. And that's the problem. It sounds louder than it should. So just someone's gentle whisper can sound loud if you've been in a room that had no sound and you didn't accommodate yet because all these muscles, everything's tight. Now, if you're in a very loud room, this is all loose. And what happens is all of a sudden a, loud, a low sound comes in. You can't hear it at all. You're deaf to it literally because these don't vibrate enough to produce a signal here. So this whole complex is, is homeostatic. It pays attention to the incoming sound and adapts to it constantly over and over again to make sure that your brain is getting a nice consistent signal and that we don't cause damage to this whole reason. At least we try to prevent it. Now, once the sound hits here, something called the oval window, that's actually a, a little miniature membrane like the tympanum, the eardrum, that vibrates a fluid now. And the sound travels through that fluid where it's in, it hits this basal membrane, which has a variety of cells, receptors that feel vibration based on pitch. So each region here detects a different pitch from here all the way to the tip. Then what happens is now, once you detect that vibration, the sound needs a way to escape. So now what the sound does is it travels here where now um, no sound is basically being detected and it goes out a little opening here that's going to be called the round window. And that sound then bounces around in here till it dissipates or, it, or the vibrations exit through the throat, what's called the eustachian tube. What happens if this is blocked? Then this sound bounces off and reverberates and comes back and you get an echo effect. So sometimes when children and adults have an ear infection and this becomes clogged with mucus and a round window, it's not doing its job, this is blocked and you get a muffling and reverberation type of sound that makes it more difficult to hear. 
Lastly, let's close up with equilibrium. So equilibrium means balance and posture. And what is my position to the environment? Am I upright? Am I laying down? This involves various signals in the skin, in stretch receptors of the muscle, and in the eyes. Hearing also plays a role, and also your equilibrium device called the bony labyrinth. So the bony labyrinth is found superficially in your temporal bones. Okay, it's composed of what's called the vestibule, semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Okay, which remember the cochlea is also involved in sound perception. It is the, um, this area is filled with something called perilymph. Okay, it's a fluid. And don't worry about it being potassium rich. Don't worry about it. It's basically similar to a fluid like what we find in our joints. It's just a fluid that, that's derived from the blood and secreted by glandular cells. So the vestibule apparatus, okay, we're going to see is composed of receptors. It's a house of receptors that detect what's called static equilibrium. That means your body's standing still. We're going to see that this region called the semicircular canals monitor what we call dynamic equilibrium. That means my body isn't moving forward, backward, spinning, moving to the side. Incredible what we see here. So what does this look like? Okay, there's your cochlea. Okay, your, vest your vestibule, which is also associated with hearing. These are both blended together. And then there's your semicircular canals. So what happens with balance? There's two things that go on with balance. Okay, the vestibule determines whether you're standing upright. That means just standing, laying down, and that's your head. <laughs> Or am I upside down or at an angle at times? I'm like kind of doing a handstand or just kind of leaning like this for no good reason. How does it do that? You'll see that this is position is dependent on gravity. And these cells respond to little basically uh, um, cytoplasmic stones and stones in this fluid. OK, that respond to gravity. So this is why if you're in an airplane and moving sometimes and under different types of pressure or in outer space or under the sea where gravity is kind of negated, this system doesn't work and these cells can't detect gravity. It also is a problem when you're spinning real quickly, what's called G-force, because it could make these stone cells, this mechanism not work properly and it makes you feel like gravity is always there. It does in one position, and this causes disbalance. Also, rocking motions throws this off, too. And this is why some people get seasick, because they never get that feeling of standing still, because it makes them feel like they're standing still, yet they're seeing motion. And it's a very difficult thing. So this, I know in pilots, from my own experience, can cause problems when you're going through a lot of G-forces or going through certain flight positions. It, your brain tries to compensate, and this causes a lot of flight accidents and miscalculations. The same is true in boating. So that's where your static is. Where your dynamic is, it's looking at the flow of liquids through these chambers that are at every angle, I mean, at right angles to each other in every position that's imaginable for your body. So these, so when you're moving forward, you're going to see that fluid flows in one in one direction, and in a, and in another direction in the others, and that is sent as a signal for forward rotation or backwards or spinning, and that is cool. So these are so this is looking at more of movement. This is looking more at my static standing still position. And all those go as signals that goes to what's called the vestibular nerve, which eventually attaches to the cochlear nerve and passes along with sound. Now, our type of ear is funny because it's, it's really uh, um, a little, it's based on 
the equilibrium device that we find in fish. And I'm not going to go too much in that, but it's a very unusual structure the way our ear is compared to other animals. Because some animals hear sound through an actual separate structure that's not connected together as a vestibular cochlea uh, unified device. So what do the receptors look like for vestibular? Okay, what happens is we have in the vestibule, we have this liquid with little stones called otoliths in it. Okay, and what happens is when these otoliths lay flat or at an angle compared to these support cells, these cells can determine angle. So angle is determined by how cells, cells settle and the angle of these cells in that position. Don't worry too much about it. But basically you're feeling you're feeling the angle of these cells shifting with gravity and stones sitting on top of them. Because if the stones are there, I'm standing up. If the stones are away from you, I'm upside down. And depending and the angle of me affects the angle of this in relationship to the stones. That's static equilibrium. Okay. Static equilibrium works together with the eye telling you position, with stretch receptors and postural muscles telling you your position, and with the vestibular apparatus telling you if you're moving also what position I'm in. Because the static is a more difficult thing to kind of keep in track. So this is a very important process, very complex process, and I think you're finding out in AMP all of it is complex. So on that note, I'm going to leave you with that, and we are done with the content that we need to know.